Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesecke, and this is The Limiting Factor. Those who follow Tesla closely will be aware of Tesla's alleged acquisition of a company called Scilion. In this video, I'm going to explain what Scilion's technology is and my literal moonshot idea for where this technology might end up. Before we begin, a special thanks to Bradford Ferguson of Halter Ferguson Financial and the Patreon supporters listed in the credits. It's the support on Patreon that keeps me grinding away on niche topics. Back to Scilion. First, it's worth noting that we've received no confirmation of whether Tesla has acquired Scilion, and it's also worth noting that Scilion may have other technologies than the one I'm going to lay out below. The information in this video is derived from two sources. The first is a Scilion PDF that was removed from the internet shortly after I downloaded it. The second is a 2017 patent application by Scilion. This image was provided in the Scilion PDF. At the bottom of the image is a key that describes what each part of the image is. SI stands for silicon, which is typically an anode material. This lets us know that Scilion's product most likely has to do with a high silicon anode. What's CPAN? I did a search on this acronym through research websites and found that PAN stands for polyacrylonitrile. Polyacrylonitrile is a common industrial material and it's used to make carbon fiber. However, the C remained a mystery to me for several months. The patent application points out that the C stands for cyclized. Cyclized means that the polyacrylonitrile has been heated to stabilize its structure. This stabilization also results in the polyacrylonitrile becoming more conductive, which is a requirement for anode material. However, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's dive into the patent application. Daniela Molina Piper and Tyler Evans of Scilion were listed as the inventors of this patent application. Daniela is the president and chief operating officer, and Tyler is the chief technology officer of Scilion. I'll refer to Daniela and Tyler as the inventors for the rest of this video. The patent application was originally lodged with an international patent body on 13 October 2017 to stake a claim and begin the search for any competing applications. The inventors begin by laying out basic facts about silicon and anodes. For example, it has 10 times the capacity of standard graphite anode material. However, that energy density comes at a cost. When a conventional graphite anode is charged up in a lithium-ion battery, empty spaces in the graphite structure are filled by the lithium ions. This means graphite only expands by 10 to 13 percent during cycling. With silicon, there are no empty spaces and the lithium actually bonds directly to the silicon, causing the structure to expand and contract by up to 300% during charge and discharge. This causes the silicon to tear itself apart. During this process, the SEI layer is also destroyed. SEI stands for Solid Electrolyte Interphase. The SEI layer is a protective layer that forms on the cathode and anode particles. It's created by the electrolyte reacting with the anode and cathode. Much of the material used to create the SEI layer is from lithium in the electrolyte solution. If that SEI layer is left alone, it consumes very little of the battery's lithium reserves. If the SEI layer is destroyed every time the battery cycles, it uses up the lithium in the electrolyte solution, which reduces the battery's cycle life. Cycle life refers to the number of times a battery can be charged and discharged. That's where Scilion CPAN, or cyclized polyacrylonitrile, comes in. As the image here shows, the CPAN, shown in blue, is used to coat the silicon particle. The silicon particle is shown changing from light gray to black and back to gray as it cycles. When the lithium enters the new particle and fuses with the silicon, the silicon still expands and contracts, but the CPAN holds the shattered particle together. The inventors referred to this as self-contained fragmentization. During the first cycle, the protective SEI layer forms over the C-pan, shown in light brown. 
The C-Pan takes all the mechanical stress, and the SEI layer remains mostly undisturbed. Because of this, the SEI layer doesn't need to completely reform itself each cycle. And because it doesn't need to reform itself, it doesn't use up lithium from the electrolyte solution. Let's take a look at how the C-Pan coating would be manufactured. The researchers start by saying that they believe they've created the first drop-in high-loaded silicon anode product. A conventional wet slurry manufacturing process and equipment could be used, rather than requiring new manufacturing equipment. The wet slurry process starts with mixing, where dry powders are mixed with liquid solvent. The formula for conventional lithium-ion batteries is 90% graphite powder, 5% carbon powder, and 5% binder powders. The graphite is the active material that stores lithium ions. The conductive carbon allows electricity to move to and from the graphite more easily. And the binder holds the electrode together. Those powders are then mixed with the liquid solvent to create a slurry. The C-Pan electrode still starts with a dry powder. However, the recipe is silicon powder, rather than graphite, along with carbon powder and polyacrylonitrile powder. The inventors state that several different ratios can be successfully used for the powder mixture. They called out one ratio to use as an example. That ratio was 30% silicon powder, 55% carbon powder, and 15% polyacrylonitrile. Once again, the powders were mixed with liquid solvent to create a slurry. The result is the image shown on screen, where the polyacrylonitrile has formed a uniform 3 to 5 nanometer coating. The inventors didn't specify in the wording of the patent whether the carbon particles are in the core with the silicon or in the shell with the polyacrylonitrile. Now that we have a wet slurry mixture, the next step is to apply that slurry to a copper foil to make an electrode. Earlier, I mentioned that conventional graphite anode only expands 10 to 13 percent. Because the graphite anode expands very little, it isn't difficult to keep the anode attached to the smooth copper foil backing as the anode expands and contracts. This works out well for conventional lithium ion batteries because smooth copper foil adds less weight to the battery. Foil is only as strong as its thinnest point. Rough copper foil is heavier because it needs to maintain a minimum thickness for strength, but it's also thicker in some areas to create a rough surface. The Silion C-Pan anode is applied to a rough copper foil because the anode expands by up to 300% when it combines with lithium. Unless the C-Pan anode is strongly attached to the copper foil, it will peel away from the copper foil. A rough surface helps the anode stick to the foil like a rough road helps your tires get traction. Although the anode is heavier, the energy density of the silicon will more than make up for the space and weight. The inventors note that their battery also required a higher negative to positive ratio, or NP ratio, than a conventional lithium ion battery. A higher NP ratio means that the anode has greater energy storage capacity than the cathode. Typically, the ratio is around 1.1 in a conventional lithium-ion battery. Why are anodes manufactured with excess energy capacity compared to cathodes? There are several reasons, but one reason is that if the NP ratio is below 1, then the anode can't store all the lithium ions that arrive from the cathode. The ions then plate directly to the surface of the anode particles rather than being stored neatly between the graphite layers. This is dangerous and can lead to the battery shorting out, causing an explosion. The NP ratio of the Sil ion battery was much higher. For example, in the 30% silicon recipe mentioned earlier, the NP ratio was 1.3. In the first cycle, the silicon core is pulverized. This pulverization causes a loss of energy capacity in the anode. The inventors make up for this pulverized silicon by increasing the capacity of the anode which raises the NP ratio. The NP ratio is controlled by adjusting the coating thickness in the wet slurry process. The slurry containing silicon, carbon powder, and polyacrylonitrile is coated to the copper anode foil. After the wet slurry is applied, the next step is for the electrode foil to be dried. 
After the electrode is dried, it's calendared. This means that the electrode is run through rollers that compress the electrode material. This makes the surface of the anode material flat. It also brings the anode material to the correct porosity. What's porosity? Now that all the solvent has evaporated, it's left gaps between the particles and the anode material. Those gaps are called porosity. Some porosity is needed to allow the anode to access the lithium ions in the electrolyte solution. However, too much porosity reduces energy density. With the silicon anode, porosity needs to be very high to allow for expansion and contraction. If there's not enough porosity to allow for expansion and contraction, the anode will separate from the foil backing. The porosity of a conventional lithium ion battery anode is 30 to 40 percent. The porosity of the silicon C pan anode would need to be 50 to 70 percent to allow for expansion and contraction. The next step in a conventional lithium ion battery production process is to dry the electrode rolls at 60 to 150 Celsius under vacuum or with inert gas such as nitrogen or argon. This removes any remaining solvent. The sill ion process is the same, except the rolls of electrode are heated to 600 Celsius. This is where the magic happens. Polyacrylonitrile reorganizes itself when exposed to heat in a process called cyclization. Cyclization can be remembered by thinking of the molecule cycling through different forms as it's heated. The first cyclization stage is called stabilization and occurs around 300 Celsius. The inventors carried out the stabilization stage under vacuum. Stabilization means that instead of melting, the polyacrylonitrile molecules oxidize, or lose electrons, and cross-link with other molecules. In other words, the polyacrylonitrile molecules join together to form stronger, larger molecules that are more stable in high heat. These larger molecules also serve as a conductive matrix that allows the anode to give and take electrons from the copper foil. This is why cyclized polyacrylonitrile, or CPAN, was chosen over any other polymer. Many other polymers need to be treated with additional chemicals to transform their structure and conductivity, whereas polyacrylonitrile just needs to be exposed to heat. After stabilization, the second cyclization stage occurs at 600 Celsius. This is called carbonization and further improves the conductivity and strength. Carbonization was done under vacuum with argon gas. Because at temperatures above 100 Celsius, the copper foil of the electrode would have reacted with oxygen in the air and damaged the electrode rolls. At higher levels of heat, the chains become larger and more conductive. However, they also become more brittle, so the maximum temperature that the inventors experimented with was 1000 Celsius. Our high silicon anode is now complete. The inventors included this image in the patent application. Luckily, the Silion PDF also contained this image, which was more legible. What this is telling us is that a full battery cell using Silion's technology can last 450 cycles before it's considered end of life. The industry typically considers 80% remaining capacity as end of life. By conventional lithium ion battery standards, 450 cycles is a poor showing. This would worsen as the percentage of silicon in the anode is increased. This chart doesn't tell us how much energy the battery can store. However, I spoke to a battery researcher and asked what type of energy density this battery might be capable of if it had an average voltage of 3.8 volts. I chose 3.8 volts because this is the likely average voltage we'll be seeing in the near future from conventional lithium ion batteries. The result was roughly 278 watt hours per kilogram. This is compared to 390 watt hours per kilogram that the researchers promise in their marketing material. Why so low? The high porosity, thicker current collector, and a high NP ratio cancels out many of the gains provided by a high silicon anode. However, the cell still has several more gears. First gear. The example cell in the research paper was only 30 to 35 percent silicon in the anode. Silion is claiming up to 80% silicon in the anode, which would put the 278 watt-hours per kilogram up to 293 watt-hours per kilogram. 
Why did such a huge leap in silicon only increase the energy density by 15 watt-hours per kilogram? NP ratio. At 80% silicon, the NP ratio needs to be 1.8 in order to make up for the silicon that pulverizes itself in the first cycle. The anode would be about 45% dead weight after pulverization. Second gear. The patent application mentioned that the researchers are considering the use of lithium doping. Check out my video on lithium doping if you'd like to know more about this. In that video, I noted that lithium doping is likely still many years away, so this seems less likely. If they got it to work, it would add about 5-10% to to the energy density. If we split the difference and applied a 7.5% energy density increase, this would bring the energy density of the cell up to 315 watt-hours per kilogram. The inventors mentioned several other potential technologies. However, I have a feeling that this was just patent talk, and they were just covering their bases to protect their intellectual property. Why would Tesla acquire a company like this? 450 cycles is an order of magnitude less cycle life than we expect on battery day. 315 watt-hours per kilogram is high, but this would be stretching what is likely and is nothing to write home about. This brings us to three additional gears, which are speculation on my part. Third gear. Maxwell Dry Battery Electrode Technology, also known as DBE, could allow for silicon loadings beyond 30-35% to while maintaining or increasing the cycle life. The white paper on DBE stated that it allows for better cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is the tendency for particles to stick to each other, and adhesion is the tendency of particles to stick to the copper foil. In other words, the sticky factor. With a high sticky factor, a smooth copper foil might be used along with less binder material. This would increase energy density by removing dead weight. DBE technology also reduces the need for solvents that are required in the wet slurry process. Those solvents are corrosive to batteries and reduce battery life. The only reason they were used is because they were the only solution the industry had for high volume manufacturing until the invention of DBE. The lack of this corrosion during the manufacturing process means DBE might extend cycle life by reducing corrosion. There's no way to know how much improvement DBE would provide to cycle life and energy density, because it would all be trade secret. In fact, it may have just been marketing hype. However, we still have two more gears. These two gears would provide definite benefits. Fourth gear. By using different sizes and shapes of silicon particles, the amount of pulverization could be reduced. Elon hinted to the importance of this on Twitter a few days ago. If the pulverization could be reduced, the NP ratio could be reduced. This means that the anode would be carrying less dead weight. It could provide dramatic gains to energy density that wouldn't require far-fetched lithium doping and would also improve cycle life. Once again, this would be trade secret. The benefits would be definite, but we wouldn't know the magnitude of progress Tesla has made here. I'd cap the energy density at around 350 watt-hours per kilogram to be conservative. With the right engineering and secret sauce, we might see a bit more but not the 390 watt-hours per kilogram that Silion claimed. This is because the electrolyte Silion used in their patent application was heavier than a typical liquid electrolyte. This brings us to the fifth and final gear. The Silion battery cell uses what's called an imide-based electrolyte. Some imide-based electrolytes are more resistant to flammability, operate at higher temperatures, and have a low vapor pressure. The drawback is that imide-based electrolytes cost 100 times more than a typical electrolyte. This is because they're not currently produced at scale. Let's dig a little deeper. Tesla's NCA battery cells operate best close to temperatures that humans feel comfortable at. They become flammable at temperatures above 150 Celsius. Vapor pressure, in the simplest terms, measures how readily a liquid evaporates at a given temperature and pressure. High temperatures and lower pressures increase the vapor pressure, meaning the liquid evaporates more readily. 
The liquid electrolytes in conventional lithium-ion batteries have a higher vapor pressure than imide-based electrolytes. This matters because in extreme environments with high temperatures or lower pressures, the electrolyte in conventional lithium-ion batteries would evaporate rapidly. Depending on the cell architecture, this would cause the cell to either dry out, swell, or burst. In most Earth-based applications, Tesla battery cells are safe. However, there are two holdings in Elon's portfolio that would be willing to pay more for batteries that are safer and more stable in extreme environments. SpaceX and The Boring Company SpaceX would be willing to pay a premium for battery cells like this for three reasons. One, space is hard, flammable batteries make it harder. NASA is also interested in imide-type liquid electrolytes because of their greater safety. A safer battery may also mean less shielding material and lower weight. Two, the batteries would be operating at low pressures or in a vacuum, which may make vapor pressure a concern. Three, Operating in a vacuum also means that there's no atmosphere to radiate battery heat to, which means the battery thermal management system is more important. Higher thermal tolerance means a lighter weight cooling system. This could save millions in launch costs over time. In other words, if Tesla can develop a battery that works better in a vacuum with higher heat tolerance and safety, it has a compounding effect on weight because less packaging and a lighter thermal management system is required. If that battery cell also has a much higher energy density than a typical battery cell, SpaceX might be able to reduce the weight of battery packs for extraterrestrial exploration by 50% or even more. What about the boring company? Tunnels are a confined space. Any heat that's generated, which is a huge amount with a boring machine, is trapped in the tunnel. So a battery that actually works better at high temperatures is ideal. Finally. Any fire that breaks out can quickly suffocate anyone working in the tunnel. Elon puts high value on human life, and safety is usually his first priority. As I said at the beginning of the video, this is a moonshot idea. There are many missing pieces. However, based on what I found in this patent application, the battery cells Silion is working on would be high-performance specialty cells perfect for extraplanetary use cases and niche use cases like tunnel boring. In summary, despite the high cost and shorter battery life, the Silion battery cells would easily pay for themselves in launch cost savings. And even more importantly, the cost of the battery pales in comparison to the cost of human life, whether that's in space or underground. Silion may also be working on other forms of high-loaded silicon anodes for Tesla battery cells that will go into vehicles, but that's not indicated by anything I found in this patent application. Elon did state on Twitter that carbon-silicon anodes are one of the key elements to a battery, but carbon-silicon is already in Tesla battery cells. They're mostly carbon with a dash of silicon. Just enough silicon to help energy density, but not enough to cause volume expansion problems. Something certainly seems to be going on with Tesla near Broomfield, Colorado, where Silion is located. Tesla is hiring battery engineers that have experience with battery prototyping and silicon anodes. This indicates to me that Tesla is rapidly iterating in a skunkworks type operation similar to Neuralink or SpaceX at Baca Chica. That is, they're likely designing a manufacturing system along with the battery. As stated in previous videos, high-loaded silicon anodes may be four to five years away. If Tesla starts a skunk works to tackle high silicon anodes, whether for spaceships or vehicles, they might have a viable cell within a couple of years. But that time frame would be a stretch. I'd love to be wrong here and see a silicon battery sooner. Besides the time frames I've suggested, there's another reason why I don't think Celion Tech will be part of what's revealed at Battery Day. Tesla's R&D line, called Terra, is at Tesla's Kato Road facility, along with a prototype Roadrunner line which is currently being built. If there is another prototyping line a thousand miles away, it's probably working on something different. Whether that something different is a specialty cell for SpaceX or a technology that will eventually go into Tesla vehicles, it appears to be high silicon, which means higher energy densities. 
Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are, especially if you have a passion for space technologies and know something about the type of batteries that will be needed for off-planet exploration. In the next video, I'll be releasing a final video on Tesla Battery Day. This will be a wrap-up of the original series, along with updates based on what we've learned in the past five months. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video, or snag something off the merch shelf below. I'm also active on Twitter and Reddit. You can find the details of those in the description, and I look forward to hearing from you. A special thanks to Stephen Wilson Barker, Thomas Marty, and Joel Brown for your generous support of the channel and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.